As we come to the end of our Halloween-themed video essays, we're turning our gaze to possibly the most obsessively overanalyzed horror movie of all time. Anyone who's seen the documentary Room 237 knows just how intricate and detailed the various fan theories explaining The Shining can get. And unlike the other movies I've covered this month, there are a ton of video essays here on YouTube covering Kubrick's horror classic. We'll get into some of the more out there theories in just a little bit, but first, I think we need to state what The Shining is unambiguously about. The supernatural and domestic abuse. These are the two elements that are most firmly established in the opening scenes of the film. The supernatural is hinted at cinematically, in the ominous cinematography and score of the title sequence, narratively in Allman's mention of a violent murder in the Overlook Hotel's past, and finally confirmed by Danny's psychic vision of the elevator of blood. Domestic abuse is alluded to in both Wendy's costume and Shelley Duvall's performance, with her thrown together clothes and nervous behavior suggesting, in Ashley Botwell's words, a disheveled woman in a state of confusion. More obviously, abuse is described in Wendy's story of Jack dislocating Danny's shoulder in a drunken rage, a revelation made all the more terrifying by Wendy's refusal to acknowledge the act as abuse. The juxtaposition of these two expressions speaks volumes about Wendy's marriage and her inability to recognize it for what it is. Though the striking image of a bloodletting elevator privileges supernatural violence as the driving force of the story, the ordering of scenes suggests that the domestic is the true source of horror in The Shining. Consider that on first viewing, Jack's meeting with Ullman is remarkably unscary. Both men are pleasant and courteous with each other, with the grisly details of Grady murdering his own family some years prior delivered casually and without affect. The focus of the scene is largely exposition, laying out that Jack will be working as the Overlook's caretaker and that he and his family will be living there in complete isolation. It's only with the context of the second scene that we realize the full significance of this, that Wendy and Danny are going to be trapped alone with their abuser. This is the lingering dread which accompanies us up the mountain and into the Overlook's halls. It may seem somehow boring to start a discussion of The Shining with such a firm grounding of the film's opening moments, but I think it's necessary. Art can be interpreted any way, but the best interpretations tend to be the ones that actively engage with the text rather than use the text as an excuse for rambling. So readings that The Shining is Stanley Kubrick's coded confession for faking the moon landing don't hold up. Not only because they're built on conspiratorial nonsense. I'm not saying we didn't go to the moon. I'm just saying that what we saw was faked and that it was faked by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, you know, I've had, I've had uh, visitations, you know, and uh, they're definitely watching me, uh, for sure. But because they don't have anything to do with the themes of the film. And in this regard, there's only one theory from Room 237 that I find truly convincing that the film is a metaphor for the genocide of indigenous peoples in America. Ullman does casually remark that the Overlook Hotel was built on an Indian burial ground, so we might infer that this sacrilegious act is the cause of the ghostly presence. Or maybe it's just a red herring, the film invoking a then well-known horror trope without fully embracing it, sowing yet more ambiguity. But whether the Indian burial ground is diegetically relevant or not, the reference is nonetheless meaningful in a film loaded with allusions to indigenous Americans. Room 237 cites the following examples of indigenous iconography. The calumet baking powder in the pantry, the mural Jack repeatedly throws his ball against, and the portrait of an indigenous elder on the Overlook's wall. What's significant is all three of these references allude in some way to indigenous genocide. The Calumet Baking Powder's bastardized caricature of an Indian warrior refers to how indigeneity is appropriated and commodified by American business. The ball against the mural is an aggressive act targeted at an indigenous symbol. And as for the portrait, it's telling that as the camera passes, Wendy and Ullman discuss the royalty who have stayed at the Overlook, juxtaposing indigenous peoples and the colonial powers which inflicted violence upon them. And you might think these are mostly reaches on my part, but what seals the deal is the scene at the bar, where Jack, seemingly inexplicably, says, White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden. Which is a curiously loaded phrase. Derived from a Rudyard Kipling poem 
White man's burden is a racist doctrine which holds that colonization is a responsibility of the white man to bring civilization to the more savage races. In other words, an excuse to engage in conquest. Jack's reference to the concept, in conjunction with the other discussed illusions, transforms the Overlook into a metaphor for America itself, built upon a history of indigenous slaughter. More than just a ghoulish visual, the Elevator of Blood represents the violence buried in the foundations of America, rising again to the surface, whether we want to face it or not. Such an analysis recontextualizes The Shining's European poster, and its reference to the wave of terror that swept America. Something else the reference to White Man's Burden does is remind us that the racism and genocide alluded to throughout The Shining are not just acts of violence, but acts of violence which create and maintain hierarchical power structures. And this is where the indigenous subtext relates to the themes of domestic abuse. It is abundantly clear throughout the film that Jack Torrance abuses his family. He dislocated his son's shoulder, verbally berates his wife, projects his own failings onto her, and by the end of the film is out to kill his wife and son. But even before Jack's violence escalates, it's clear how afraid Danny and Wendy are of Jack. Consider Danny nervously asking if Jack would ever hurt either himself or his mother. Or how despite a myriad of ways a child could hurt themselves in a massive hotel, Wendy immediately blames Jack for Danny's bruises. But arguably scarier than the abuse itself is how casually Jack's abuse is enabled. Think back to the film's opening scene, the largely pleasant interview where Jack first gets the job as caretaker. It is a remarkably mundane moment for a film that will eventually become deeply horrific. And it's also the first major divergence Kubrick and co-writer Diane Johnson made from Stephen King's novel. In the novel, this scene is much more antagonistic, with Jack pondering what an officious little prick Ullman is. And Ullman bluntly stating that he doesn't like Jack, and doesn't want to hire him for the job, specifically highlighting Jack's history of alcoholism and violence. This version more overtly establishes Jack's capacity for abuse but I'd argue the conflict-free scene in the film is far more frightening because of what it suggests. Namely, that abusive men are not challenged for their violence. Rather, they are actively enabled and allowed to perpetuate more harm. The sense of neglecting victims of abuse is often reflected in analysis of The Shining. For all the creative thinking documented in Room 237, not a single person ever mentions domestic abuse. Perhaps such subtext was considered obvious, but it's still odd that so many people digging for the hidden depths of The Shining fail to mention the violence right in front of them. This is even reflected in the film's aesthetic, with Kubrick rejecting the darkness and claustrophobia that define so much of horror cinema, opting instead for bright and open, because the violence it portrays is not something hidden in the shadows, but something that occurs in plain sight even if it's so often overlooked. Once isolated in the hotel, Jack wields his violent abuse to control how his family behaves, detailing where Wendy can go, and shifting all maintenance work to Wendy so that he can focus on his writing. Crucial too, Jack's most violent abuse is prompted when Wendy challenges Jack's authority, wanting to leave the Overlook and get Danny a doctor. With his own power openly questioned, Jack seeks to violently silence his dissenters. In both the subtext of indigenous genocide and domestic abuse, The Shining demonstrates how violence is used as a means of seizing and maintaining power. These threads are further linked through the supernatural, and specifically, through The Shining itself. Two characters in the film shine, Danny and Dick Halloran, and though it is never said outright, the implication is the ability is related to being a victim of abuse. Tony, the supposedly imaginary friend who warns Danny about the Overlook, first appeared after Danny was hurt by his father. And while Halloran may not refer to any abuse in his past, as an elderly black man in America, it's reasonable to assume he's experienced some degree of racial discrimination throughout his life. The film goes out of its way to plant this idea, in fact, not only in its references to other forms of racism, but in Grady's use of a racial slur to describe Halloran. Moreover, Consider how Danny's shining manifests itself throughout the film. 
as visions of the horror at the Overlook. When Danny asks Halloran about these, Halloran describes the visions as traces of the past, only visible to those who shine. You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Taken in conjunction with analysis of the film's indigenous subtext, Shining is, essentially, the ability to perceive history. More specifically, the violent histories upon which nations, upon which power, is built. Not everyone can see this history, but it's always there, always holds sway. Those who can see, those who shine, are able to precisely because they too have experienced violent abuse, and therefore are more aware of violence's presence. Danny sees, and eventually, so does Wendy. After Wendy is finally able to consciously recognize the trauma in her own life, she is suddenly flooded with images of the Overlook's horrors, symbols of the latent horror which has surrounded her and her family for so long. The patriarchal structure upon which her family is organized, and the white supremacy upon which American society is organized, stem from the same hierarchies of violence. Creatively, however, this is a very difficult needle to thread. Any efforts to link the violence of an individual to that of greater society runs the risk of trivializing the former, of diminishing responsibility. What you're saying is, everything is society's fault and we as individuals never need to take responsibility for anything. Uh, no. Similarly, many horror stories draw on the elements of domestic abuse while placing blame on an external other. Men may hurt women, but only because they are being controlled and manipulated by a supernatural force that they can't truly comprehend. This is indeed an element of the novel. King's Jack Torrance is a flawed person, but it is the supernatural influence of the Overlook most responsible for driving Jack's violence. An influence that Jack ultimately overcomes, sacrificing himself so Wendy and Danny can live. This does not happen in Kubrick's vision. <laughs> There's certainly no heroic sacrifice, nor is there any sense that Jack Torrance is a good man led astray by evil forces. King himself has criticized the film for shifting Jack from a victim of the supernatural to a malicious and harmful person. This is, of course, precisely the point. Jack is not the victim of The Shining, he's its villain, and he is so from the very start. Before the Torrances even arrive at the Overlook, Jack is teeming with irritation and hatred for his family, and Wendy in particular. The only times he shows her any sort of kindness is in front of the hotel staff, when he still needs to perform a basic facade of decency. The closest thing the couple get to a nice intimate moment is when Wendy serves Jack breakfast in bed. And even this seemingly pleasant moment moves into uneasy territory when Wendy says something Jack doesn't like. It's just a matter of settling back into the habit of writing every day. Yeah, that's all it is. <laughs> Even when Jack implies remorse for hurting Danny, it's clear he really feels bad for himself and blames Wendy. That bitch. As long as I live, she'll never let me forget what happened. The Overlook is not a malevolent force pushing Jack towards evil. It's yet another environment, wherein Jack will be rewarded with power for abusing his family. A reflection of how societies reward tyrants and bullies, yes, but not one which reduces Jack to a pawn of social forces. Because the evil at the heart of The Shining is not the hotel or the twins. It's not Grady or Lloyd, it's not the elevator of blood or the snow-covered hedge maze. It's him. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. 